Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, we will see some applications of Silo's theorem. First, we begin with uh, recalling all, all three Silo's theorems. So, let us uh, start with the group G. So, let uh, G be a group. So, it is a finite group. So, let us say it has cardinality P power E times M, where this uh, E is the largest possible exponent such that P power E divides the order of G. In particularly, P does not divide M. So, G C D of M comma P is 1. So, this is what given information. So, then uh, what we know? So, we know that uh, there exists a silo P subgroup. So, any group of order P power E is called silo P subgroup. So, the very first Silo's theorem says there exists a subgroup H of G such that the order of H equal to P power E. Okay. So, such subgroup is called Silo P subgroup of G. Okay. So, first result, first theorem of Silo's says about the existence of silo P subgroup. The second theorem talks about uh, how one can compare given two silo P subgroups. Suppose uh, H and K are two silo P subgroups that means the order of H and order of G both of them are P power E. Order of H sorry order of K both of them are P power E. So, then we can prove that they are conjugate in G. Okay? That means, there exist G in G such that G H G inverse is exactly equal to K. In particularly, all silo P subgroups, they are all conjugate. Okay? So, the third theorem, so that talks about actually a number of silo P subgroups. So, if you denote N P of G by the number of silo P subgroups. So, since we are in a finite group, so the number of silo P subgroups will be finite. So, we can talk about the number of P silo subgroups. So, then uh, if we denote that by N P of G, then this N P of G has some constraint. So, this N P of G first of all must divide this M. Okay, It actually divides the order of G and it is also co prime with P power E. So, that means it should divide M and if you take this N P of G, so that must be congruent to 1 modulo P. Okay? So, these two important constraints we have for N P of G. So, in particularly we can use uh, this information about N P of G okay, uh, to say something about for example, group of orders, group of small orders. Okay? So, that is what we are going to do now. So, we have these three important uh, theorems by Silo, okay, which actually guarantees existence of Silo P subgroups and their conjugacy and how to count the number of P sir, number of Silo P subgroups. Okay, so, let us use it and then try to actually conclude uh, many interesting corollaries. Okay. The very first corollary, one can apply it for finite abelian groups. So, then it is clear that any finite abelian group is just a direct product of its uh, silo P subgroups. So, that is called primary uh, decomposition theorem. So, this is the corollary, first corollary. So, if G is abelian, okay, again you say it is a finite abelian group and you write the order of G call it capital N, so which is the product of these primes P, power, P 1 power alpha 1 etcetera P r power alpha 1. So, this is the prime factorization of uh, this number capital N. So, then what one can prove? One can prove that G must be isomorphic to this G of P 1 cross etcetera cross G of P r. So, what is this G of P i? So, where G of P i is nothing but the silo P i subgroup 
of G. Okay. So, this is an immediate corollary of Silo's theorems. So, how one can prove this? First of all, existence says there exists Silo P subgroup for given any prime divisor P of R of G. So, existence of G of P i clear from the first Silo's theorem. So, now uh, since uh, G is finite abelian group, if you take any two subgroups of uh, this G that has order let us say P i power alpha i. So, because they are conjugate, so that says that they must be equal because the conjugacy will be trivial. So, it must be actually equal. So, that says that G of P i must be normal subgroup of G. Okay. So, here is the proof. So, if you take G of P, so which is the silo P subgroup of G okay. so where P divides let us say R of G. So, then this must be normal in G as G is abelian as G is abelian because any subgroup of abelian group is normal. So, it must be normal. So, now if you take the product G of P 1 times etcetera G of P R. So, that must be a subgroup of G. So, there is no other option, but now if you take these R different subgroups, so then look at uh, the intersection between them. Okay, You take one particular G of P i and then intersect with all other possible products okay, G P 1 etcetera G P i minus 1, G P i plus 1 etcetera G P R. Okay, You take one particular group and then intersect with the remaining products, then it is easy to see that this is indeed trivial. So, what is the meaning of that? That means, there is no common element other than identity between these two groups. Okay. So, how one can see this? Note that what is the order of G of P i? The order of G of P i is P i power this alpha i and what will be the order of this group? So, this is whatever it is, it is going to be the product of those, those such groups. For example, by induction you can assume that the order must be the product of the order. Okay. So, so, whatever it is, so if you take any element from this product, so how it is going to look like? So, let us take some g which is in this product, call it pi. So, then this g can be written as some g 1 etcetera g i minus 1, g i plus 1 etcetera g r. So, that much we know. So, now if you raise this g power product of all this p j, j not equal to i power alpha j. So, then you can see that, so this is going to be exactly equal to identity. That means, whatever the element G does not matter the order of G from this product is going to divide this product P j alpha j j not equal to i. But if you take any element from this G of P i that should divide P i power alpha i because that is the order of that group. So, that means if you take some element G which is in the intersection G of P i intersection pi then what happens? The order of G divides P i power alpha i and order of G divides this product P j power alpha j, j not equal to i. So, that means the order of G must divide the G C D between them which is 1. So, that forces G is identity because this P i power alpha i and the rest of the product must be relatively prime because P i's are all distinct primes. So, that forces that this G must be identity that means the intersection between the product of G P j's j not equal to i and G P, G P i they are the intersection must be trivial. So, that shows that uh, if you take uh, the product of all these groups. Okay. So, if you take so this is something I will leave it to you to check. So, this is not very hard to check. So, you can prove that the product G P 1 etcetera G P R now you I am taking all product then this is naturally isomorphic to 
g of p1 cross etc cross g of pr okay in particularly the cardinality of this product gp1 etc gpr is indeed equal to the product of pi power alpha i, I range from 1 to r which is exactly the order of g okay so note that the product gpi it is a subgroup of g which has exactly the order order of g so that implies g is equal to this the product gp1 etc gpr and which is isomorphic to gp1 cross etc cross gpr okay so this you can do it by induction so this is just uh, by induction you can prove because when r equal to 2 case we have already done so this actually generalizes for the general r okay so this proves that g is indeed isomorphic to the pro direct product of its silo p subgroups okay whenever g is finite abelian group so indeed one can use uh, uh, this information uh, in order to prove the structure theorem of finite abelian groups which says that any finite abelian group is actually direct product of cyclic prime power order groups okay so which is something we will be proving later okay this is first immediate corollary of uh, silos theorems okay so that actually uh, says uh, some very important fact about finite abelian groups if you take any finite abelian group it is actually direct product of its uh, silo p subgroups that is what it says okay uh, so now let us actually uh, move on and then try to understand uh, other uh, groups of orders small orders okay so as an example let us actually uh, start with uh, one particular example let us say the group has order let us say 15 okay so one can also start with uh, order 6 which we have already actually understood if you take a group of order 6 we proved already it is either cyclic group or it is actually uh, the, the symmetric group S3 okay but now we what we want to look at we want to look at uh, this uh, group of order 15 so which is just uh, the prime factorization is 3 into 5 so our claim is uh, this group is indeed cyclic so it must be isomorphic to z modulo uh, 15 each okay let us see why it is the case so now let us look at this n uh, 5 of g okay this is the number of silo p silo 5 subgroup okay the number of silo 5 subgroup of g so what are the condition let us call it n 5 so n 5 divides 3 so that means n 5 must be either 1 or 3 those are all the possibilities and the n 5 must be congruent to 1 modulo 5 so this is the second possibility but you can see that uh, this n 5 equal to 3 will not satisfy this condition n 5 congruent to 1 modulo 5 because 3 is congruent to 3 modulo 5 okay that forces that so these two condition forces that n 5 must be 1 if n5 must be 1 that means the number of silo 5 subgroup is 1 but we have already seen if there is only one silo p subgroup then it must be normal because any two silo p subgroup must be conjugate so if there is only one silo p subgroup then it must be normal so that forces that the silo 5 subgroup must be normal in g Similarly, let us look at n3. So, n3 must divide 5 because 5 is that m, okay. And then that forces that the n3 has choice 1 or 5. Now, let us take n3 that must be congruent to 1 modulo 3 because the prime is 3. And these two conditions now you can see that 5 must be congruent to 2 modulo 3. So, that forces that n3 must be 1 okay, as before. So, that means silo 3 subgroup that is also normal in G. And let us call this is H5, this is H3. 
So, then you can see that both H 3 and H 5 both are normal inside G and what will be the intersection H 3 intersection H 5 must be trivial because one group has order 3 another group has order 5 both are cyclic if there is X which is there then order of X must divide 3 as well as 5 because they are relatively prime. So, order of X must be 1 so that forces that the intersection is trivial. So, in this case we know that G must be isomorphic to the direct product of H 5 and H 3, but H 5 is isomorphic to G modulo phi Z because it is cyclic and then H 3 is isomorphic to G modulo 3 Z because again it is cyclic of order 3, but 3 and 5 are relatively prime that forces that G is isomorphic to Z modulo 15 Z as 3 and 5 are relatively prime. That means any group of order 15 must be cyclic that is what it proves. Okay. Such uh, conclusions that one can make even for some bigger groups, okay. uh, bigger groups means for some general groups having uh, prime factor 2 exactly 2 prime factors. Okay. So, let us let us call it as proportion. So, this is again corollary of uh, Silo's theorem. Okay. You can call it corollary or proportion whatever you want. So, let us start with the group G. Let us say it has order P Q and assume that P is less than Q because we know something about uh, group of order P square. So, any group of order P square must be abelian. So, and there are actually uh, so, one, one is going to see later using the structure theorem of uh, a finite abelian groups any group of order p square must be either isomorphic to z modulo p square or z modulo p cross z modulo p. Okay. This is something you can prove even without using the structure theorem. Okay. So, maybe I will leave it as exercise. So, what is exercise? If order of G is P square, we already proved that G must be abelian. Okay. If G has order P square element, then it must be cyclic. So, in this case either G, this is cyclic Z modulo P square Z or if there is no <coughs> element of a order P square, then it is Z modulo P Z cross Z modulo P Z. Okay. So, you can actually pick uh, one such subgroup and then look at another subgroup and then you can see that the product of that will be G. Okay, this is something you can verify directly using elementary properties of the finite abelian groups. Okay, now, what happens if you have two factors assume that P less than Q without loss of generality. Now, uh, for some technical reason let us put that P does not divide Q minus 1. Okay. So, in this case we claim that G must be isomorphic to Z modulo P Q Z. So, that indeed it is cyclic group. Okay. So, why this technical condition is needed let us see. Uh, so, let us look at N P. So, which is the number of silo P subgroups. So, then this must be congruent to 1 modulo P and N P must divide uh, that relatively prime number which is uh, Q. So, this forces that N P either 1 or Q. So, now you see that N P cannot be Q because Q if N P is Q then Q is congruent to 1 modulo P, but we have assumed that P does not divide Q minus 1. So, this forces that N P must be 1. Okay. So, that means if you call it HP, so that is the silo P subgroup of uh, G. So, then you can see that this must be normal in G. So, that is what uh, we could conclude. So, now uh, let us look at uh, uh, what happens to uh, NQ. So, NQ again should divide P. So, NQ the only possibility is 1 or Q sorry 1 or P. So, now uh, N Q must be congruent to 1 modulo Q. 
So, that forces that this n q is 1 or if it is p then what happens then p is congruent to 1 modulo q ok. But uh, p is not congruent to 1 modulo q as p is less than q. If p is congruent to 1 modulo q then that forces that p minus 1 will be greater than or equal to q. So, that forces that p is greater than or equal to q. So, that is not the case p is less than q. So, that means the only possibility is n q is 1. So, now n q is 1. So, that means if you take this h q which is again silo q subgroup of g. So, that is also normal in g. So, now we are in the previous setting. Then if you look at g which is has to be the product of h p and h q and then note that h p intersection h q must be trivial because any element of this intersection should have order that dividing both p and q, but p and q are relatively prime. So, it must be identity. So, in this case you can see that g is naturally isomorphic to h p cross h q which is e z modulo p z cross e z modulo q z, but since p and q are relatively prime. So, this is isomorphic to e z modulo p q z. So, this proves that in this particular setting when you have distinct prime factors when p does not divide q minus 1 and p is less than q then we have g is isomorphic to the cyclic group e z modulo p q z. Again the other case also actually can be said something ok. So, let us actually uh, look at the other case. So, when uh, p divides q minus 1. So, assume that order of g is p q and then p less than q. So, now you can assume that p divides q minus 1 and then in this case what we can say of course, uh, g can be abelian. So, g uh, so in this case uh, you can prove that g must be a cyclic group of order p q ok because okay maybe this is something you can check independently. So, the exercise if g is abelian and order of g is p q p less than q. So, then g is isomorphic to e z modulo p q z. So, why that is the case? So, you have two elements of g one has order p another one has order q. Since g is abelian, so both the subgroups that you generate using those elements they will be normal in g and g will be just a direct product of those two subgroups. And since uh, uh, the cardinality of those two groups subgroups of uh, are relatively prime. So, g must be isomorphic to that z modulo p q z. Okay. So, the similar reasoning that we told here in this case works here when you assume g is abelian. But if g is not abelian then what we can say? So, we can assume that g is not abelian. So, then uh, look at this n q as before. So, this n q should divide p that force that n q is either 1 or p. So, these are all the two possibilities and n q must be again congruent to modulo p ok sorry modulo q. So, that means n q cannot be p because then p is not congruent to 1 modulo q as p is less than q. So, it is very similar reasoning that we gave earlier. So, that shows that this n q force to be 1. So, that means if you take this h q this is the silo q subgroup of g then it is unique and it is normal in g. So, we can guarantee for sure there exist one normal subgroup of g ok. So, now you can see that if you take ok by using Cauchy's theorem there is actually at least one element of order p inside g let us call it h p which is 
generated by x where order of x equal to p. Again this h q you call it generated by y where order of y is q. Then it is easy to see g is indeed generated by x and y and in particularly the product h p h q is going to be g. So, note that h q is normal okay, h q is being normal. So, that implies h p h q the product is exactly same as h q h p. In particularly h p h q is a subgroup of g. So, that just follows from h q being normal. Okay. Now, if you if you take the intersection, so from the previous argument you can see that again this intersection must be trivial because if we have an element in this intersection, the order of that element should divide both the p and q that forces that order must be 1. So, that means the intersection of these two subgroups must be trivial. So, so we are in the situation that g is product of this h p h q and if you take the intersection between these two subgroups that is trivial. And note that this h p is a subgroup of g and this h q is a normal subgroup of g. So, somewhat we are almost in the direct product situation, but ex except that one group is normal another group is not normal. Okay. So, this group is not normal this group is normal, but all other properties are satisfied. Okay. So, such a situation we call actually G is a semi direct product of these two groups. Okay. So, indeed uh, we say in this case G is internal or inner semi direct product of this H p and H q and we denote this by H p this simple H q H p semi direct product H q. So, this direction should be pointed towards the normal subgroup. So, this should be pointed towards the normal subgroup. So, that is the notation. Okay. So, we want we also want to record which one is normal and which one is not normal. So, this V shape should be pointed towards the normal subgroup. Okay. This indeed actually motivates one to define semi direct product. So, I am actually hiding uh, lots of details here. Okay. The semi direct product is not only depending upon two subgroups, it also actually depends upon how one of the subgroup is acting on the another subgroup via this conjugations. Okay. So, maybe in the next class I will explain uh, all those details, but uh, what is this actually uh, analysis says? So, again once you know what is semi direct product then basically uh, using silos theorems. So, you are able to determine all possible groups of order p q okay, for distinct primes p and q. So, when p does not divide q minus 1 you are getting a cyclic group of order p q and when p divides q minus 1 there are two possibilities. So, when it is abelian then you are getting cyclic group of order p q and when it is not abelian then you are indeed getting semi direct product of those two cyclic groups. So, that is uh, you see that h p is nothing but e z modulo p z and h q is nothing but e z modulo q e z. So, basically you are getting semi direct product of these two groups as your g and of course, the semi direct product depending upon how this uh, group actually h acts on this uh, normal subgroup via conjugation. So, if you actually change the action then you are expected to get various different semi direct products. Okay. But in this case when you look at these two particular examples where e z modulo p z and e z modulo q e z such that p divides q minus 1. So, yeah, then you can prove that it does not matter how this e z mod p z acts on e z mod q z all the semi direct products will be isomorphic and that isomorphic group 
that is what you get when for this order particular order PQ. So, there is only one non abelian group of order PQ. So, which is exactly given by this unique semi direct product of EZ modulo PZ and EZ modulo QZ. So, this is also called so the G is also called extension of this EZ modulo PZ by this EZ modulo QZ. So, basically we are saying that there is only one extension possible in for this particular groups. Okay, I will explain uh, in the next class uh, what is the semi direct product and then uh, how to define both inner uh, semi direct product as well as uh, outer uh, semi direct product. Okay, using that uh, we will actually see that. Uh, so, I will not be able to prove that uh, if you take uh, all possible semi direct products uh, uh, using this uh, two groups EZ modulo PZ and EZ modulo QZ, you will be getting uh, same isomorphic uh, non abelian groups. But anyway, uh, so I will just uh, define it and then leave it to you to think about it. Okay, so I will stop now. Uh, like I said, uh, we will continue with the semi direct product and other possible uh, applications of Silo's theorems. So we will stop here. Now. Thanks.